The Joker is one of pop culture's most iconic villains, and many actors have gotten the chance to take on the role. We've stacked the Jokers against each other before, but there have been a few groundbreaking interpretations of the character since then that we have to talk about. Keep watching to see how Joaquin Phoenix holds up against Heath Ledger, Jack Nicholson, and the rest as we rank the Jokers worst to best. Despite coming in dead last on our list, the version of the Joker that appeared on the new Scooby-Doo movies isn't unforgivably terrible. He's just flat-out boring, which might be an even bigger problem. Plus, he's a complete failure, as he can't manage to even scare Scooby-Doo, a character defined by being terrified of everything. Now, Pengy Wengy, watch me lure them into the room of doom. The only thing that's worth mentioning about him is that he was voiced by veteran comedian and actor Larry Storch. And let's be real here, that's only interesting if you're the kind of person who likes to get into some hardcore trivia about the cast of F Troop. You have to be putting me on. If you want to develop a whole new appreciation for Batman the Animated Series, take some time to head back to 1977 for the new Batman Adventures which features some of the worst character redesigns ever. Amazingly, the Joker who was voiced by Lenny Weinrib managed to escape that particular flaw in the show. But he looks a lot like he does in the comics is about the only good thing you can say about him. His major accomplishment during the show's entire 16-episode run was losing an election for President of Criminals when the Penguin invented a mind-altering substance called Crime Slime. If you can't win an election against the Penguin, what are you even doing? I, the notorious Joker, will stage the biggest ripoff in the history of Gotham City! <laughs> In all honesty, we only included D. Bradley Baker's turn as the Joker on this list in order to be as thorough as we can. That's not to knock the guy, but as the Joker's appearance in Son of Batman is limited to appearing as a shadow on a wall and letting out one laugh. But it was a nice laugh, at least. <laughs> The Super Friends saga ran for eight years under various titles, but the Joker only ever appeared once. When the show was commonly known as the Super Powers Team, in 1985's The Wild Cards, where he was voiced by Frank Welker. Unfortunately, his appearance was both minor and bizarre, with the Joker turning up as part of the playing card-themed supervillain team at the Royal Flush Gang. He's not the team's Joker, though. He's actually disguised as the Ace. If your story calls for a chalk white villain named after a playing card to dress up as a different chalk white villain named after a playing card, things are getting a little needlessly complicated. The superpowers old headquarters will soon be our new base on Earth. Oh, don't you love the irony? <laughs> You know those memes where they intentionally mix a bunch of geeky franchises in order to induce nerd rage? Well, the Young Justice version of the Joker feels a lot like that. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt your regularly scheduled mayhem to bring you this important announcement. He's the Joker, but he looks like David Tennant as the Doctor and is voiced by Brent Spiner from Star Trek The Next Generation. It's not exactly terrible, but it's overshadowed by just about every other version of Joker ever. Here's the weird thing about Steve Bloom's performance as a Joker. It's really only here on a technicality. That's not a knock against Bloom as an actor, but rather has a lot to do with how those games used to be structured. See, the original gag with the storylines of the LEGO games is that since they were adapting incredibly popular franchises, the developers figured everyone playing the games already knew the story. That gave them the freedom to present their versions as a slapstick pantomime, with all the dialogue that players already knew by heart replaced with incomprehensible muttering and the occasional wordless reaction. Lego Batman, on the other hand, was the first time the franchise had dipped its toes into an original story, but they kept the pantomime stylings for the first outing. As a result, Bloom lent his voice to both Batman and the Joker, but didn't wind up doing much more than a few grunts and appeal or two of maniacal laughter in the role. To say the role of the Joker in an animated version of Frank Miller's classic The Dark Knight Returns presented a challenge is putting things pretty mildly. The character's arc went from catatonic to insanely murderous, requiring a ton of range. Person of Interest star Michael Emerson gave it a shot, but played it just a little too flat during the first parts of the Joker's journey. At the end, he ramps up to a satisfying fever pitch, but this one is a little too uneven to rank any higher. It doesn't matter. I win. I made you lose control. <laughs> and they'll kill you for it. If you enjoyed the big screen Lego Batman movie, then we have good news and bad news. The good news is there's already a second Lego Batman movie you can watch. And in fact, 
It's been available on home video since 2013. But here's the bad news. It's really just an extended adaptation of the storyline from the LEGO Batman 2 video game. Really though, that's only bad news if you've already played the game. If you haven't, the actual storyline is really fun, with the Joker and Lex Luthor teaming up to terrorize Gotham City with a laser beam that can deconstruct anything made of black LEGO bricks like, say, everything that Batman owns. Christopher Corey Smith, who also played the Joker in the second and third LEGO Batman games, once said moved to a fully voiced story mode, is really just turning in a pretty standard riff on Mark Hamill's Joker. It's perfectly good and highly enjoyable, but it's not quite the original. Well, well, Lex Luthor, presidential candidate and Superman's least favorite bald person. When you're hiring someone to play the Joker, it stands to reason that two of the most important qualifications are going to be a morbid sense of humor and an insanely creepy laugh. If that's the case, you could do a hell of a lot worse than just going out and getting the guy who played the Crypt Keeper on Tales from the Crypt. Beware of skeletons, unless they're yours truly. <laughs> That's exactly what happened in 2010, when John Cassia lent his voice to a series of shorts packaged with Fisher Price's line of Super Friends toys. Cassia does a good job of mixing up his performance, though it's still instantly recognizable to anyone who was a fan of the 80s HBO anthology, which probably did not include any of the kids in the target audience. We hope. Finally! You made it! Now the fun can really begin! <laughs> The Joker we're given in DC Super Friends is pretty great if only because of how much he clearly hates working with the other supervillains. Voice actor Lloyd Floyd's audible eye-rolling adds some fun nuance to a performance that's otherwise pretty much by the book. But hey, he does get bonus points for not copying Mark Hamill like so many others have done. You created him, Lexi? Uh... Oh, and I thought you had no sense of humor, you old card, you! It was a lab accident. You have to get past a design that starts with a tattoo of the word damaged on his forehead, and just spirals out from there until he looks like he should be performing alongside Dark Lotus at this year's gathering of the Juggalos. Then, you have to get past all the stories of Jared Leto going method and sending his co-stars live rats, dead pigs, and used condoms. What you're left with is… well, not much of anything, really. For all the hype surrounding Leto's appearance as the Joker in Suicide Squad, it pretty much amounted to about 10 minutes of screen time that were mostly there for Harley Quinn's origin story, and some ill-advised fan service. When Arkham City was announced as Mark Hamill's final outing as the Joker, there was a pretty big problem. As Batman's arch nemesis, the clown prince of crime was definitely going to be in the next game, which told the story of an encounter much earlier in Batman's career. Thus, the role of the Joker fell to Troy Baker. And the problem here is obvious. He pretty much just did a dead-on impression of Hamill's Joker for the entire game. To be fair, he actually does a really good job of it, but a copy is just never going to beat the original. That's... <laughs> it's just... It's just... <laughs> what a night! The people behind Gotham clearly know that they can't really have the Joker show up years before Bruce Wayne becomes Batman on account of his origin story being so tightly intertwined. So they just went ahead and created a guy who isn't technically the Joker, but is definitely a maniacal supervillain with a permanent rictus grin who dresses as a circus clown and wants to sow chaos wherever he can. Cameron Monaghan's performance as Jerome Valeska is ridiculously compelling, and has made for some pretty wild television. I'm the boss. <laughs> first things first, the Arkham franchise has produced some of the best video games in recent memory, and without question the best Batman games ever. Unfortunately, even though they got the legendary Mark Hamill to do the voice for 3 out of 4, they also ended up giving us a Joker who has what might be the single stupidest master plan in the character's 75-year history. Seriously, after perfectly executing his scheme, he unveils his ultimate masterstroke, which is… turning himself into a giant drug monster and getting in a fist fight with the greatest hand-to-hand -hand fighter in the world. Really, dude? Dumb things like this are why you never beat Batman. I can take it. I can take anything you throw at me, Bats. You can't beat me. I'm actually going to win! 
The redesign of the Joker for the Batman is remembered as one of the most divisive missteps in the history of DC Animation. Laboring under the shadow of the legendary Batman the Animated Series, and stuck with the task of incorporating the Batwave gimmick of the accompanying toy line, designer Jeff Matsuda decided to go as far in the opposite direction as possible from Bruce Timm's sleek design from Batman the Animated Series. The result wasn't very well received, to put it mildly. But Kevin Michael Richardson's take on the Joker actually had some really good stories, such as The Laughing Bat, where Joker becomes a vigilante and uses joke venom to turn Batman into a bad guy, so he has a supervillain to fight. That's pretty awesome. Graffiti. That's a pretty serious offense, girls. But that's why I became a crime fighter, to take out garbage like you. Sometimes the Joker is a sinister, psychopathic murderer, and then other times he's a goofy and delightfully manipulative weirdo who brings down an entire city armed only with a spoon. Joker stories that are actually funny are pretty rare these days. So having a version of the Joker as whimsical as Jason Spisak's take on the character is a rare treat. And the fact that this short also introduced his sidekick Spoonie is a hilarious bonus. Can you make dogs invisible? Spoonie, that's not even a real superpower. Perhaps a demonstration for Spoonie. Adam West, Burt Ward, and Julie Newmar returned to the roles of Batman, Robin, and Catwoman in Batman Return of the Caped Crusaders. That was great, but the rest of the cast was given the unenviable task of playing specific versions of characters identified with actors who had died years before. For Jeff Bergman, that meant playing Cesar Romero playing the Joker. It was a high-wire act, as Bergman had to be respectful of both Romero and Romero's take on the Joker. But Bergman nailed it in a performance that feels like a true tribute. You dare defy us? You must be insane. And here's the proof. <laughs> From day one, Gotham has been a show that wanted to have its cake and eat it too. And there's no character who embodies that spirit more than Jeremiah Valeska. I want to be the star of the show! Gotham spent years being a Batman show without Batman, where the Riddler wasn't the Riddler yet, and the Penguin wasn't the Penguin yet, but all of the weirdest elements of the franchise like the Order of Saint Dumas and Professor Pig are present and accounted for. In this context, Jeremiah is the closest we got to a proper Joker, and he still doesn't quite make the cut. Not only is he a double fake-out, the twin brother of the guy that we thought was going to be the Joker before he died, who then got dunked in chemicals and took a liking to purple suits, he also comes as close as you can possibly get to being the Joker without actually stepping across the finish line. Even in the series finale, he steadfastly refuses to pay off the setup, instead referring to himself by every J name in the book except the one we want. I don't know, call me Jack. No, that's not right. Joseph, John, Jay. I don't know. And as frustrating as it is, that's also kind of great. There's a deliberate goofiness to the way he dances around the Joker issue that's genuinely charming and fun. He's the kind of character that makes you wish the entire series had been this bonkers from the beginning. Another show that had to follow in the footsteps of Batman the Animated Series was Batman the Brave and the Bold which decided to embrace the character's lighter Silver Age phase from the comics of the 50s and 60s. This Joker, which was voiced by Jeff Bennett, looked a lot like the work of legendary Batman artist Dick Sprang, and really shined in stories like the alternate world Tale of Earth 3, where a heroic version of the Joker became the last superhero on Earth under the name The Red Hood. Whoever he is, I hope my counterpart on your world will have a chance to repay you. Somehow that seems unlikely. You really have to give it to Joaquin Phoenix for his performance in the title role of 2019's Joker. He commits to the part. Arthur Fleck is legitimately difficult to watch. There's the grating of his compulsive laughter, the body horror shots of his emaciated figure and spindly limbs, and the disturbing relationship with his mother. We watch him go through a seemingly endless string of physical and emotional beatdowns, and Phoenix is nothing if not committed. His shift from the pathetic Fleck to the twisted Joker is a masterful performance indeed. Unfortunately, that performance is in a movie that doesn't deserve it. No matter how compelling you find Phoenix's performance, a lot of the dialogue will make you roll your eyes. The worst sin of Joker, though, is that it strips all of the mystery away from the character. That's what sets Joker apart from other supervillains and makes him as compelling and scary as he is. With Arthur Fleck, we get a meticulously detailed report about his childhood abuse, miserable adulthood, and how he got his name, explained a couple of times in case you missed it. 
Jack Nicholson's performance as the Joker in Tim Burton's 1989 Batman movie is pretty fantastic on almost every level. He's certainly the best part of the movie, with Nicholson's already creepy grin accentuated by caked-on makeup and some truly amazing fashion choices. And the scene where he trashes an art museum might be the most baller thing a supervillain has ever done. Gentlemen, let's broaden our minds. Lawrence! The only problem with this version of Joker is his alter ego, Jack Napier. In the comics, a big part of Joker's origins is the idea that some fundamental change in his personality occurred when he fell in that vat of acid. Here though, he's pretty much already the Joker. He even carries a deck of cards with him, and he's obviously a criminal, and that undermines his arc. Otherwise though, it's totally awesome. Even if you don't recognize his name, you're almost certainly familiar with John DiMaggio from his roles as Bender on Futurama, Jake the Dog on Adventure Time, and Aquaman on Batman the Brave and the Bold. In 2010, he landed the role of the Joker in Under the Red Hood, and he didn't disappoint, delivering a Joker who delivers every line as though it is an actual joke, giving you the sense of someone who genuinely thinks that beating someone to death with a crowbar is hilarious. It's memorable in the creepiest of ways. So. Let's try and clear this up, okay, Pumpkin? Pretty much everything about Cesar Romero's portrayal of the Joker on the 1966 Batman TV show is great. From the way he attacks every scene with manic, scenery-chewing glee, to the way he twists his painted-on grin into a disappointing scowl when he's inevitably defeated. All the way down to the fact that Romero refused to shave his mustache for the part, instead caking on the clown makeup and leaving it completely visible in every episode. There's a panache and even a little menace to the role that makes him one of the show's most memorable characters. <laughs> Unfortunately, the show's writers were bigger fans of The Penguin and Catwoman, and Romero often got stuck in boring and forgettable stories which didn't allow him to really shine. A true shame. Of all the Joker's appearances across movies and TV, who would have expected that the one that really went into whether his motivation stems from a twisted sort of love would be the one based on building block toys for tiny children? And yet, here we are. In a world where that's just not acknowledged in the Lego Batman movie, but serves as a driving force for the entire plot, Zach Galifianakis nails the voice work too, making this modern Joker one of the best ever. You're obsessed with me! <laughs> no, I'm not. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Yes, you are! Who else drives you to one-up them the way that I do? Bane. No, he doesn't. Between the massive initial hype and the outpouring of grief following the untimely death of actor Heath Ledger, it can be a little difficult to judge his performance as the Joker on its own merits. But when you put aside all the baggage and really look at it, the truth becomes clear. It really is that good. Good cop, bad cop routine? Not exactly. The Joker of the Dark Knight is both terrifying and genuinely funny, but more than that, he's got an air of mystery that's almost impossible for a character so well known to cultivate, with virtually every line he delivers turning out to be a carefully conceived manipulative line. He has one truth you can bank on though. Ledger's Joker is one of the most influential and iconic movie villains of all time, but he's still not the best Joker of all time. When you get right down to it, Batman the Animated Series did everything right. The slick, stylish take on the caped crusader boiled everything down to essentials, and no character benefited as much as the Joker. The Joker was frightening and funny, with a sweeping theatricality that came directly from Mark Hamill's amazing turn providing his voice. And the desire to give Hamill's Joker even more to do directly led to the creation of Harley Quinn, who has gone on to become one of DC's most popular characters. Add it all up and the animated series Joker remains the definitive take on the character. And that's… no joke. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite comic book characters are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.